stuff. All right. So um, I I began by saying that Mike and I have have made some some progress on um, on this uh, <clears throat> uh, this approach to. Uh, generalizing uh, Christian's construction. Um, so again, the, the, the setup is you've got your category C, which is your term language, and you've got a particular map and the V, which is your collection. And then you have uh, another map um, <sighs> which is um, sub, which goes from, let's say that, uh, hang on, I'm just, I just wanna make sure I'm, I, I pick some good, um, characters to, represent the map from C to V is useful to have mnemonics. And I'm just going through our notes. Yeah, here we are. All right, so let's say that F, uh, F is the one that runs from C to V. So we've got some functor F that runs from C to V. Uh, and then we look at integral F, which is the growth and deep gadget. Um, and so now um, when C and V are, when f is an endofunctor, i.e. c and v um, are the same, so we're interpreting our term language in our collection language. Um, then we, uh, then you can, if you have, uh, if f is a strong monad, so you have a, a tensorial strength, uh, which basically allows you to distribute the product through the, the monad through the tensor. Um, uh, then you can do a lot of stuff that we want to do. Um, uh, in, in particular, what we're interested in is that um, C is V enriched. Now, if F is a monad, what that means is that C is equal to V so V being V enriched means that V is actually closed. So that's uh, that's the thing that's um, uh, ha has been a constraint that we wanted to look at a, a little bit more carefully. Greg, um, did you mean to share a screen because we're not seeing a screen? No, I'm not sharing a screen. I'm just talking. Okay. Um, so, 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 um, right. So when, when a category C is V enriched, um, what, what that means is that the, the hum gadget between two, um, objects in C is going to be a V gadget, right? That's the meaning of that. So, um, we, but when C is equal to V, that means the hum is a V thing. Um, so that's that's essentially the closedness. Um, so to get away, to to lift our to to, to try to contact sort of naive intuitions. You know, I, I confess that my um, my category theoretic intuitions are, are not as well developed as Christians and Mike's. I'm just, you know, 
I'm not really a category theorist. Um, but uh, if you if you want to understand what one way to think about this is, we're interested in collections that sport a power gadget. Um, so if we use set as a model of what we're interested in, or as an example of what we're interested in, given a set, um, you want to be able to take the set of all its subsets, right? So that's the power set construction, right? So, you're, so if we now think of set as like a monad, right? So you're taking set on something, um, then uh, you're going from set to set squared, right? So that's actually comonadic in characterization. Uh, so, so that's, so, so we need something that supports that. And so now when you try to run examples of your collection being something like list, you run into a problem. And the, the, the problem is that um, uh, there's no way to make um, a, a no natural way to make a list of all lists, right? And the reason is because the um, some of the sublists are not uh, naturally ordered. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? I've got I've got some lists. I, I think Go ahead. I do. Uh, can you can you also uh, uh, let in uh, Nadzik? He's waiting. Oh sure, sorry. Yes. Thanks. Uh, I think I, I can follow you when you're when you're saying that uh, you need something commonadic in the sense of uh, from list to to list of lists. Yes, right. But 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 list doesn't work. Um, because there's no natural way to order all of the sublists of a list. So, and that that gives us a little bit of a clue, right? So, if you if you think about it, uh, and and this to me was a was an exciting insight. Uh, I hadn't I hadn't realized this before, and it's it's given me a whole bunch of interesting insight. So so let's 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 um, let's think about this in terms of composites and components, right? So a list is a composite, and the elements of the list are components, right? And and that allows us to think a little bit more clearly about the kinds of things that we might want to uh, include as our notion of collection. If our compositor allows us to have to separate the components, right? So in the case of a list, I can have two sublists which are completely separate. They don't overlap in any way. Just like I can have, you know, subsets of a set that don't overlap in any way. Their set difference is is empty. Right, or, or sorry, is the union of the two, or their intersection is null, uh, is the empty list. Um, so in, in that case, you can't have an ordering which arises from the compositor. Now it might be that there's an ordering that arises from the elements themselves. So if the, ele if the, uh, the the entity from which we're drawing the elements comes with an ordering. So for example, it was a list of integers. So the integers themselves have an ordering. You might be able to avail yourselves of that ordering information, but you can't avail yourself of the ordering information that came from the list or came from the, the com uh, composite entity itself. Right, that. Uh, 
can I ask you, you said uh, this is not uh, the case for list, but uh, it is for set. So how, how this is different if we have, uh, for example, set of integers? Uh, so, so the point is that set has forgets all order. Mm -hmm. So we don't have oh, to see. order them, right? So we can make a, a set of sets because we don't have we don't have this requirement that's impinged on us by list to order them. I see. So that's kind of the that's kind of the trick, right? So the 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 trick is if the composite gadget has the ability to separate the components, right? You can have the, you can have components which are separated in the compositor. Um, then uh, you will get this partial uh, ordering issue. And so the compositor has to have a notion of partiality. So an example, we could, what the smallest um the smallest thing that's you know that that has this property if you start from list and you just extend it with partiality right so that would be a tree right so you can you can have nesting you can go you can go down or you can have branching right and and from there, uh, it, it, we can observe that um, graph, the category of graph uh, is in fact closed in the way that we want it to be. Right, so, so you can have, you can make a graph out of the hum of graph homomorphisms between two graphs, right? And, and uh, so it's closed and, uh, and it has this property um, that, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we have the partiality that we want. Uh, so, so that appears to be the smallest um, gadget. Uh, and it's interesting to note that graph is not a topos. So one of the one of the one of the things that we wanted to do was to show that the logic that you get this way when you generalize is not a topos. Because topos is, is effectively set, and so the kind of logic that you get is is uh, is going to be very set-like, right? So it's going to have an and and an or. That, that functions in the way that intuitionistic or classical logic function. And we don't want that, right? We want something that's a little bit more um, subtle, right? We'd like to be able to model linear logic or other kinds of logics. So the fact that this thing exists, it has all the properties that we were looking for, um, and it's not a topos, is very very good evidence uh, for uh, for uh, for for generalizing Christian's construction along these lines, right? So it's essentially, what we're you know what we what we did was to look at Christian's construction, say everywhere that um, the thing the construction sort of runs to ground at, at set and get rid of all of those places so that we don't have set playing this fundamental role. And then looking at each of the requirements uh, to, to make sure that they line up with our, at least line up with our, our intuitions, right? About what a collection has to do. And one of the things that was most um, tricky was this power gadget that isn't, set like um, it's it's enough set like 
that we could we could um, uh, we could include how sets do this, but uh, but it, it isn't set like in the sense that it doesn't result in a uh, logic that uh, that is you know effectively um, this you know the, the the logic we get from a topos. So uh, so so it it appears that we've we've found the simplest smallest example that's clearly a collection so graph is clearly a collection um, and doesn't uh, um, but and doesn't yield the topos um, but does you know we we still get all of the elements of of Christian's construction um, uh, so so it, it appears that we've we've got the solution uh, uh, under under that sort of extremely high bar of uh, constraints so that's uh that's that's very good news and again i, I just i just want to point out that all this all this abstract nonsense you know there's there's a punchline to this um getting the notion of collection right has cost um the programming language and and the community and all of their clients billions of dollars. Uh, so as I've mentioned this before, Scala as as one example, you know, so, so Scala is just one example, has gone through three and a half iterations of its collections library. And nobody knows if they're anywhere close to done, right? So that's just the development of Scala. If you move out past this uh, to other languages, and and one that's really uh, stands out as as a as a kind of just utter nightmare and misery, and yet impacts so many downstream customers, is the language R. So R is um ours legacy is the language r comes from the language s uh, s was proprietary s was essentially lisp with statistical packages thrown in right so it's basically lisp for statisticians um and then r was the open source version of that and then um and that was picked up because it was open source it was picked up by all the biotech people, all the fintech people, everybody who's doing statistical modeling, right? So all the genomic people, everybody, right? There's, there's, there's hundreds of millions, billions of dollars riding just on R and the packages that are used by R. And R's notion of collection is horrible. It is truly abysmal. And the performance of the language um, is terrible precisely because of the way that they have modeled collections. So in general, the performance, the, the, the development pipeline for R, just, just as an example, is um, uh, the, the high-end modelers write in R because it's what they grew up with and it's relatively easy for them to express things in R because R is Lisp-like. And, uh, and then after they've, they've come up with a, some reasonable approximation of the math that they're trying to express, that is then given to other people to make it into a high performance model, which means rewriting the thing in some other language. Uh, typically, either C++ or Java or some combination thereof. So this is this is the kind of development pipeline, and it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be because uh, if you got the notion of collection right um, and you cleaned up ours uh, so that it was properly functional, um, then at a minimum you would uh, that the type the functional types plus a proper notion of collection would uh, would would speed up our manifold so you wouldn't have to have all of that 
nor would you have all of the errors uh, that happen in our programs all the time. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, while it looks like I'm talking about a bunch of abstract nonsense, just these downstream consequences would save the industry hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So that's why, that's one of many, many, many reasons <laughs> to, get, to get the math right uh, so that people can, can uh, um, you know, actually have a, a, a decent framework in which to do their, uh, uh, do their um, biological models, their epidemiological models, their financial models, all of these things. Uh, so that, that's, that, you know, that, that's motivation <clears throat> uh, going back from, from my studies of programming practices for you know, at, at least uh, 15 years. Um, any any questions about what I've been saying? I'm I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, can you can you relate uh, uh, this to to uh, uh, I, uh, I was I was uh, following uh, uh, relating to to how how we are uh, iterating over collections, and uh, now uh, I see some libraries that are uh, like implementing recursion schemes uh, to uh, to somehow abstract over over different uh, structures and and collections and uh, and uh, trees and, and and how to how to iterate over. And yeah, uh, so, to, so, to, so mm -hmm. this is why we this is why we picked uh, the Monadic API. Let, that's why I picked uh, Monads as the first, uh, as the the very first uh, um, characterization of collections, mm -hmm. right? Um, but 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 uh, th this is why you know it, it turns out that it's a little more subtle. Our notion of collection is not just Monad. Um, the uh, collections need to have this power gadget, or a good, a good many of our collections need to have a power gadget, which is why it also appears to be co-monadic in some way, right? So, you know, right? What 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 we're looking essentially what we're looking for is, I need a, um, uh, I, I I need a comprehension syntax. And it appears that I also need some kind of co-comprehension syntax. Mm -hmm. right? I want to. I want to be able to to map over the collection. I want to be able to flatten a collection. Um, and and whether it's done by recursion or something else, I don't care. Right? The API doesn't tell me how that's done. So if there's an efficient way to do this, or if there's some kind of trade-off, uh, space-time trade-off. That trades off, you know, iteration versus recursion, right? At a certain at a, at a certain level, the the uh, client that's using the API doesn't care, right? It just it's it just it it just wants to be able to map or iterate or uh, flatten without knowing how that's done on the back end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, but but by the same token, if I if I, I would like to be able to split collections up, right? Divide the collection into this bit and that bit. And that's not the same, it's not necessarily filtering, but that splitting operation, that's, the, that's, the, that's really what's going on with our co-monadic construction. Right, so that's, mm -hmm. that, that's, uh, oh, uh, that, that's the other view of things, right? And then filtering has to do with, you know, does, is this element in there, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and that's also a, a highly abstracted notion, right? And, I, and I've shown the utility of abstracting that, right? The whole, the whole point of the red and black sets is, um, uh, uh, which, which I, I've talked about in Casper standups, 
All right, so you have a notion of red sets uh, with atoms, and you have a notion of black sets with atoms, and the black sets are, are uh, atoms for the red sets, and the red sets are atoms for the black sets. All right, so this kind of red and black sets, uh, they don't have any atoms really, it's just the fact that they're recursively constructed, right? So you still get a kind of, it's a reconciliation between um, um, ZF set theory and um, Frank FM set theory, Franco Matowski set theory. So, which, which means like the, the whole point of the S FM set theory is that it, um, you know, it allows you to treat nominal, uh, nominal stuff. Um, uh, what, you know, so FM set theory has been very, very uh, fruitful um, to model nominal phenomena like alpha equivalence and those kinds of things, right? So Jamie Goodbye and Andy Pitts and all those people have done, you know, a lot of good work in, in, in this regard modeling things like um, uh, references and the new operator in Pi calculus and so on, right? Um, but that they fundamentally require this, um, this uh, set, a set theory with atoms, right? So that's the, that's the FM, uh, FM set theory. Uh, and, but ZF set theory, uh, you know, comes with, without, without atoms, right? It builds, it builds the universe just from the empty set, right? Um, and you know the red black sets shows that you can get a set theory with atoms, um, with uh, where the atoms are really just uh, sets that you can't look into, and and all of that. Uh, so 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 that's that's of of high utility, right? We're able to we're able to say, look, I can get you all the atoms you ever wanted. I can give you all of FM set theory without leaving the ZF universe. All right, so that's uh, that. Re basically, if, if uh, in in uh, in terms of Greg in Greg Chaitin's world, right? Um, things that, things the the things that you have to assume, like atoms, are the risk of your theory, right? And that's a that's a very reasonable point of view. So. <coughs> So what we've done is we've said you can have all the fancy FM set theory stuff um, without any risk using using this uh, this uh, this recursion trick. So that shows that abstracting the element of relationship is uh, is of high utility. Right, we can get all of that through this element of abstraction. So that's a uh, <clears throat> That's another aspect of um, of, uh, of this notion of collection that we want to that we want to record. That so so the monadic part of the notion of collection is clear, right? We want to be able to map over our collections, and we want to be able to flatten nested collections. Right? That's that's pretty obvious. Um, the power gadget we want to be able to basically split our collections. That's also fairly obvious. And then we also need to be able to say when um, something is an element of a collection. Right. So that's, that's uh, but all of that's abstraction, right? We, we don't want it to devolve down to just being sets. Uh, so all of this, and once we, once we have this abstract characterization of what a collection is, then that should that should nail down one third essentially of the logic that we generate. So again, in the in the in the in the larger picture, what we're saying is um, uh, logical formulae denote collections of witnesses of pro, uh, i.e. programs that that um, bear witness to the formulae. Right, so it's a little bit recursive, uh, but that, um, uh, <clears throat> but that's essentially realizability, and then we also demand Curry Howard. Right, so that's a whole set of of requirements that we're working with. Right, so 
monadic characterization of your notion of computation plus some rewrite rules. So it's eff effectively that's, you know, second order Lavier theories, right? So yes, second order Lavier theories plus rewrite rules give you your notion of computation. Our notion of collection um, is, as we've talked about, is where we're going to collect our witnesses. And then the logic is collections of those instances of that second order monadic theory. And, and that ties everything together. That's, that's the universe in, in which we're talking about what a notion of logic is. Uh, it's ridiculously complicated <laughs> for some, such a simple, simple set of demands. <laughs> anyway, does that all make sense? Uh, can we can we say when when you say uh, T C and C T, so uh, is this means that uh, in our collection, which is a graph, uh, the elements of uh, this graph is our A S T, and from the perspective of A S T, we have uh, collections as. Um, no, so so the graph is not the graph of the syntax of the terms. Uh, the the graph you, you have to think about the the graph is like think of it as a, as a way of implementing your common data structures. You can you can represent a list as a graph, right? You can represent a tree as a graph. Yeah, set also. In, yeah. Yeah. So 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 graph is kind of the first the first the first place we can go that has all of the requirements uh, of our collection. Oh, I see. I see. And uh, we will collect our terms uh, in our in collection. In, yeah, that's in, right. We collect our terms yeah. in the collection. That's right. And the, 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 the first notion of collection that meets all of the requirements is uh, 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 that isn't mm. set is graph. Oh, I see, I see. So uh, multiset uh, can also be expressed as a graph, so, so graph is Correct. basically exactly. all of this. Mm, okay. That's, that, that's right, yeah. 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 And uh, what would be the like uh, good uh, uh, papers to, to read about graphs and operations on graphs? You know, that is such an interesting question. Um, because there are very, very few compositional um, approaches to graph theory. So there's, um, and even more intriguingly, um, so, so, so the, the one thing that, that I've, I've kept as a background assumption and haven't haven't put it forward yet is that that we want our collections to be computable right in, in some in some sense if it's if it's not computable then it's outside of our reach like it would be nice to have a language to talk about some of these non-computable things but at the end of the day you know i i, I want to be able to write program i i, I want somehow my my uh, my collections to be amenable to programs that manipulate them. Right? So, so they, they have to be computable. So it turns out that I have found no papers on computable graphs that are compositional. So, so, so the ordinary graph theory, the notion of composition is not present. There's something called algebraic graph theory, which is beginning to get at the idea of compositionality, but still doesn't quite nail it down. They still don't understand, you know, that compositionality is not in their bones, so to speak. <laughs> uh, uh, so in terms of compositional models, 
um, I was aware, uh, or I am aware of um, the Gelli, Cardelli, and, and Gordon uh, approach, where they they find a representation of graphs in process algebras. All right. So, so given the pi calculus or the ambient calculus, um, there's a there's a natural there's a natural way to represent graphs. And then because of spatial logics, you can now have a, a, a logic for graphs, which then, again, because logics give you query languages, that gives you then a graph query language. Um, so for example, these, these, recent, these recent implementations of graph query languages, they're, they're not very interesting um, because they don't, they don't follow this path of, relating the query language to a logic and then showing all these nice properties, right? Like SQL is clearly related to relational algebra. Like we know, I mean, that, 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 that's a good language design because we know that the, the core of SQL comes from relational algebra. So we, we know lots of things about its completeness and a, a lot of good properties about SQL. The graph query languages that that you know have been popular, they don't have those properties. They don't come with a theory of graphs that we know has good properties and then turn it into a query language. Right? So almost none of the, the popular graph query languages that are out there are exciting to me because they lack this property. Right? But the the Gelli, Cardelli, and Gardner uh, graph query language has that property. Right. It's, it's absolutely uh, uh, well formed in this regard. Um, what I did uh, for my toggle, you know, my theory of, of, of graphs, was to start from this idea of I want a uh, compositional representation of graphs, and I want it to have a complexity scaling property. Right, so um, I want it to be the case that as I walk up the complexity ladder of the graph, that the the um, expression in the language that represents that graph doesn't, you know, the, the as the as the as the graph scale in complexity, um, you know, exponentially. The, the, the program scale in complexity linearly. So you actually get, you know, high, 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 high compression in the program, in the programmatic representation of the graphs. And so I was able to achieve that, and it's obvious in the, in the presentations uh, that that's what happens. Uh, so my toggle um, uh, approach is the only other approach apart from the Gelli, Cardelli, and Gordon approach that does in fact um, yield the compositional theory of graphs. Um, I should also mention that I think it was Wells, so Barr and Wells wrote category theory for the working computer scientist. Um, uh, Wells, and, and, and that book is actually interesting because they sort of knowing that many computer scientists are familiar with graph theory or some form of graph theory, they treat categories um, as if they're a special case of graphs. Um, and uh, and so, so Barr already has, you know, kind of a, a graph theoretic bent. That's not Barr, Wells has a graph theoretic bent. And so he also produced a category theoretic um, presentation of graphs. So that that has some of the flavor of compositionality, but it's not it's not all there. Um, I, this is a long-winded way of saying um, it's not clean. If you want to read papers about graphs, it's it's not very clean. But the the one thing is we we do know that the graphs is monoidal closed. All right, so th that one is that one you can prove, and so that's what makes it be the the first sort of 
selected candidate that that fits in this this the generalization that we're pursuing of, of Christian's instruction. You know, I I just want to say that you know in in general, all of this stuff, uh, all of all of the investigation arises because there's there's so much disorder um, in the um, in the theoretical presentations of all of these different phenomena. So graph theory, not compositional. But as computer scientists, we know that it needs to be compositional. It's just like, if, you're, if your object of study is not compositional, it's, 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 you know, it's 20th century stuff. It's not 21st century stuff anymore. It just, it's so much more cumbersome, so difficult to reason about, right? Compositionality is absolutely the, the means to scaling even from the point of view of getting the mass to scale, <laughs> All right? So, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing, you know, category theory claims to be essentially set free, but it's not. Every single place that you go, there's some sneaky implicit set somewhere and, and, and ferreting out all of those implicit set assumptions is, it, it is, I mean, it's taken us years to find all of the different places where set is sneaking into our, our calculations and, and having to root them out and finding good characterizations, good abstractions that, that, that you know, clean all that up so that, so that our, 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 you know, our presentations are, ab are properly abstract. Um, uh, the, the same with the FM set theory, right? So this whole, this whole idea of atoms and taking on all that risk, uh, you know, where does the universe of atoms come from, right? Cleaning all of that up. So basically, you know, category, there's this, this funny, um, <clears throat> there's this uh, funny story about the Laplanders. Um, so they, they would do uh, a ritual after, um, after a successful hunt, right and they're they're cooking the meat they would take the bones and reading read the cracks of the uh the bones to say to determine in which direction to hunt next now the 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 you the interesting thing is that that turned out to be a successful strategy because there were essentially caribou all around them but if they had hunted in a particular pattern then the caribou herd would have picked up on the pattern and 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 avoided the hunters but because the 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 cracks in the bones were random <laughs> it, it effectively randomized their hunt their hunt pattern and so the caribou were unable to pick up on a particular pattern of the hunters and it actually guaranteed them more successful hunts <laughs> right so it's it's the same kind of thing here in mathematics in any direction you go, there is stuff to go and clean up. And cleaning up uh, uh, even a little tiny bit of it results in all of this, all of these, you know, wonderful uh, insights and, and discoveries. So, all right, I'll get off my hobby horse now. <laughs> that, that was interesting about the... Mm -hmm. That was interesting about the caribou caribou story and the hunters. That uh, I'd never heard that before. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a anthropological study. But so long-winded answer, to, uh, Thomas Love. But but graph theory is n not very clean. Um, uh, there's Diesel's book on uh, algebraic graph theory, and then there's Wells' uh, um, a very long paper on category a category theoretic approach to graph theory. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look. Th thanks for this answer. I, I'm, I'm, I, I want to know more about graphs and uh, yes, I'm, I'm confused in, in, <laughs> in lots of uh, cases. So uh, I was also uh, uh, trying to, uh, to implement in, uh, in your uh, theory of graphs uh, on uh, stack edit. Uh, 
so I was uh, I was trying to I, I think you you uh, presented rock alcohols and I was trying to uh, hunt alcohols or or other other way around I, I not remember exactly so I wanted to ask you what I did wrong and so. oh okay uh, what did you have some uh, problem I mean, with the implementation. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm sharing my screen, and uh, uh, here is uh, uh, here is about uh, uh, lambda calculus and row calculus, and I'm not sure. I, I think you you presented uh, lambda calculus, and I, I tried to do with uh, uh, with row calculus, and sure. And I I'm, I'm just I, I was not sure that I'm doing the right thing, so so I just wanted to ask oh. you. If, if oh, oh, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, all all that all that that does is it encodes the syntax tree as a graph. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, that, that's, that's all that's happening. You, you encode the syntax tree as a graph. So if, you figure, if you've got your syntax tree as a graph, then, uh, um, I'm sorry, and then you also encode the reduction tree as a graph, right? So that's the that's the other thing. So it's I can't tell. Let me see. It's a little bit small. Okay, uh, I can I can make it bigger. Uh, you you presented the lambda calculus, right? Yes, that's uh, I think you, you you said it somewhere here. Yeah. So so here is the for for the calculus. Uh, sorry. It, it was a long time. It was a long time that I was uh, writing this. So I don't remember exactly uh, what I was, uh, what questions that I have. But I think I think reductions uh, was uh, for me like I was not sure that I'm doing the, the right thing. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I can take a look at it. I can't see it. I'm on my phone, so I can't see it very well right now. But. Okay. Okay. I will, I will uh, share the link with you. So yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, one of the interesting things, though, is because the toggle theory has a notion of uh, graph expressions, you can then take the syntax tree of the graph expression as a graph, right? So you automatically get a notion of reflection. Right? So there's a you 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 have a you have a graph, you have its corresponding expression, and then that becomes a graph and then that has an expression. Mm, yes. Right? So so all, all of those things are available in the toggle theory. And none of that is discussed in graph theoretic con contexts. Because people are not thinking about, you know, um, modeling graphs in this way. Right? They don't think about graph expressions. Whereas, you know, because they're not worried about uh, computability in the way that I'm worried about computability. Mm. So, yeah. I, 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 was, I, I was trying to model this in the, in, in the relational database with uh, self-reference table and with uh, common table expression. So I can recursively, uh, like with query, I can generate uh, uh, like graph from, uh, from this query. And uh, 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 I was thinking how to encode the query inside the graph itself. So I think it's like very related and I'm super interested to, <laughs> to, to somehow exactly do what you said. Yeah, well, see, this is, I mean, the, the, the reason I was not so worried about, like in, in the case of uh, Gelly, Cardelli and Gardner, right, that they, um, their logic generates the query language. Um, but because in the back of my mind, I knew I had the OSLF algorithm, um, if I got the term language for graphs correct, then I would automatically get a logic and then automatically get a query language. So, uh, so, so, so the, the, the reason I mention this in this connection is because um you'll uh, uh 
with OSLF, we completely generalize everything that was done in SQL, right? SQL was, was not a one-off. It's a pattern. And OSLF takes that pattern and lifts it to work across a much, much broader range of gadgets than just relations. Like a, a very, very large range of gadgets, right? Uh, you know, I mean, a gigantic, infinite universe of things, <laughs> um, much bigger than relations. And, and, and the, the opportunity is, uh, that, that, that gets generated by this is to find, uh, like once you've generated one of these query languages, uh, th then to go and find optimizations of that representation that fit best with the hardware that's in the market or to make or to use that as a guide to designing special purpose hardware that's going to execute that particular kind of query language better right so this, you, you see what i'm saying it's like like once you have this there's this huge area of of opportunity that we that i haven't touched um because it's just it's too big um, that is that is all about optimizing these queries. Uh, in some cases, you'll be able to map them down onto onto the existing relational architecture. But in most cases, like in any case where you've got a par uh, as a part of your term language, the, the existing existing query languages are not going to work. They're not they're not going to be optimal. You'll have really really bad complexity. But there are but there are other opportunities, there are other hardwares that, that might uh, support this better. Um, not the least of which is, is quantum computing, right? So, so there's lots and lots of, um, uh, yeah. yeah, I guess opportunity is the only word that comes to mind. There's lo lots and lots of, of, of stuff to plumb uh, here in order uh, from, from that point of view. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I believe it would generate a giant, a gigantic market um, uh, of, because there's so many cases where, you'd, where you, you'll get uh, a query language that's generated and you can speed it up by orders of magnitude if you find the right optimization path. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, right, so, so you can imagine like, you know all these special purpose uh, query uh, uh, query systems, where people you know they take you know a good decade to find a, a good optimization, and then and then offer it up, right? And then the whole sharded architecture of our chain means that there's a place for that special purpose query, right? So you know let's say that they've uh, they've come up just as an example, right? Some, someone comes up with a compositional representation of video data, right? That's something that hasn't been done. Right now it's all streams, right? But let, let's say that someone comes up with a, 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 a video image language, right? An algebra for video images. Uh, it's, not, it's not unimaginable. You know, you might start with Clifford algebras as an example. Uh, as 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 a, as a beginning point, uh, and then come up with a, uh, a uh, an algebraic characterization of, of of video data, right? Then you can run OSLF on that, right? So now you've generated a query language for video images, right? And then um, uh, uh, now the the, the Mapping that naively onto hardware will take forever to, to run your queries. But let's say you spend a good 10 years, you optimize that uh, so that it, it, works, it works efficiently and robustly. And, uh, and so now you can search on the basis of the content of images, right? which is something we can't do at all today. All images currently are, uh, are searched on the basis of time and uh, uh, timestamps and tags, and that's it, right? So, but, but, 
But if you offered that capability on a, an R-Chain shard, people would absolutely include that shard in, in, other, in other transactions. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I, I already uh, I seen some some languages for expressing uh, the the plot in the in the movie or, or sure so yeah but we that's can, different. We can maybe right? start from there. Yeah, well, no, but the pl the pl the plot is a narrative structure. Not all images have a narrative structure, right? <laughs> right. So someone someone could just go down to the airport and take video of the of the uh, landings and departures. There's no plot structure in that, but there's tons of interesting information in videos of the, uh, of the landing and departures at a given airport. I see, I see. Right, there's no, there's no narrative in satellite images uh, uh, of the earth, right? But there's tons of interesting data in that, uh, in those satellite images, right? And so if you, if, if you had an algebraic characterization of images, right, then that would be very useful from a query perspective. Can we, can we somehow, uh, if we generate this uh, once uh, with uh, some representation for, for, for the image, uh, can we somehow extend this later and say, uh, now we are extending our language and uh, can we somehow use the, the previous generated uh, data. Yes, that's the whole point. That's why it's compositional. That's why it's algorithmic. Was for a, to deal with exactly that case, right? Mm, okay. So, so, re, so remember, I'm uh, the, when I was thinking about this 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 algorithm, I'm looking at it from the point of view of query languages for biology, right? And knowing that the biologists have their domain specific understanding, and that's always changing, right? Because it's a scientific thing so you, you like ha having a complete theory of stuff like that is almost impossible right your, your your understanding of the physical world is always iterative right like even after 400 years of optics you know people come along and say oops you missed the spot <laughs> and, 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 the, and the theory gets revolutionized then we get you know and then we get meta materials that give us invisibility cloaks and all kinds of stuff right after 400 years so so <laughs> so 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 any any scientific theory is always provisional right <clears throat> so, so especially in biology so you know the the context in which i'm thinking is all right so we come up with a little domain specific language they learn something we need to rejigger that language add a feature subtract a feature co consolidate two features into one that kind of thing so whatever logic I'm, whatever um, logic slash query language I come up with, I've got to be able to generate it quickly, right? And that's, that's why the, the compositional structure of the language together with the, 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 uh, alg the, the uh, algorithmic way of generating the query language, that's, that's why this architecture. All right, I think we're over time. Yeah, so it's time to head over. But thanks, thanks to everyone for letting me rant and rave this morning. <laughs> thanks, thank you. This is super interesting. Cool. All right, ciao, ciao.